I hope they want more information on any of the topics discussed today. So, first things first, when you're building a brand, or if you have a brand, naturally you want to understand, are you solving a problem, or are you trying to suggest something new? So are you solving, or are you suggesting? So the idea behind a successful product is to learn, are you going to emulate or imitate your competitor? So when you're thinking about creating something that's gonna stand out, you gotta understand why would your product stand out versus what somebody else already has in the market. So, a lot of brands, what they would do is they would go reference shopping, and they would go to a US store, they'll look at their competitors, and they'll try to understand what their best products are being offered in their own target. The, the key to this is, of course, you don't wanna completely knock off any, anybody else's work, what you really want to do is you want to focus on the idea that you had originally that drove you to this market to, to begin with. So we were looking for the why. The why is so important. Why do you even want to bother starting this brand? If there's other things that you could be doing with your time and energy, why do you want to do this? And that question is an open-winded question that we hope that you discover on your journey from the start to the end. It's not always obvious why a brand should be started. Sometimes you may find yourself pivoting at critical moments, and that's okay. And a lot of big brands that we work with today started with an idea that was completely different than what they ended up doing in the end. So we think, and we suggest that thinking about your own product, that you think about first, if there's already a product like yours available, what you can do to make it better, or if it's something completely new, and you think the market could benefit from it, what is it about that idea that you think is gonna be in demand and how to bring it out is the next slide we're gonna talk about next. So, Clarissa is gonna speak about a brand, an actual brand we work with, and some of the challenges they face and how they tackle them. Hi, um, so I'm just here to provide some like, real design, design for references and what I'm just talking about. So. In addition to uh, emulate versus imitate, uh, we see a lot of success with brands aim to solve a specific problem. Um, one of the brands that comes to mind is Joe Bella. Uh, we worked a lot to help designers develop a line of adaptive wear. So these garments are meant for uh, those who may have a condition that restricts them from being able to dress themselves every day. Um, more importantly, these people may have dementia or Alzheimer's in that uh, they can dress themselves maybe 70% of the time, but other times they need help from a caretaker or a family member. So these garments were technically designed in order to look like a normal garment in the front, but also have some specific technical entrances and ex exits on the side as well as in the back so that those who are maybe helping them can help dress them. Uh, this is a problem that they saw in the market that just didn't exist or the things that did exist just were cute. And they wanted to make sure that these people who maybe aren't feeling like themselves every day still felt like they were looking like themselves um, and just kind of create a sense of familiarity in a time when they just weren't feeling lost. So this is a really great example of a brand that um, looked to find to, to, to solve a problem in the market. Uh, and they were started ordering hundreds and now they're ordering thousands. So for them, creating a product that solved the problem was really effective for them. Thank you. So I'm sure you've seen this diagram uh, before. Uh, it's a combination of fast, good, and cheap. Now, all of these circles are very good on their own hindsight. There's nothing wrong with selecting one of these and starting from the beginning. So good, great product, fast, really fast to your customer, cheap, a very important element that a lot of brands look for. We recommend starting with one of these circles initially and don't try to emulate or combine the second one until you're well off in your first kind of collection, in your first drop, just because you may find yourself pivoting on the spot. So a lot of brands will start with one circle, say they want to get to the market fast, say it's a, uh, a, um, a drop shipping line or a white label, private label, and they know their customer wants it in three days. 
Well, guess what? Maybe after they launched and they decided that, hey, the customer doesn't care about speed as much as quality, they will pivot. They'll actually completely remove fast and go to good or cheap. So the idea here is to understand how these function and how they cross each other, but also learn that it's not as important to really focus on one right off the bat. It's more important to understand what it is that your audience and what your market really wants. And that's another thing that we're gonna talk about as the conversation continues, how to piece together what it is that you're trying to build versus what your market is trying to tell you that you need. Because a lot of creators start with something that is passionate to them, so they'll start a company or business that they have an interest in or something that they may feel passionate about. But that's not always a good idea to do or to start a business around. For example, we have a, a client that does very well in the uh, pickleball space. They haven't played a single game of pickleball. They don't know anything about it personally. But they still went into business because they've identified that as a growing niche and a growing market. So you don't necessarily have to combine interest with business to make it successful. What you do really need to know is how to market it is there a market for your product and how to tap into that market and what your product needs to look like in order to hit those goals. Now, of course, starting out on your own is difficult and you know there's a lot of programs and mentorship available to you that you can tap into to kind of accelerate the growth. Most brands or most billionaires for that matter has worked with mentors and somebody else who's been there before and really access pick their brains a bit and you can save a lot of time headaches just one one or two golden tips from a mentor that you can kind of fall back on and that is a highly recommended thing that we are also going to discuss but something just to keep in mind as you're going on your journey um, really important to connect with the right audience the right people that can kind of help you along we're going to talk and first we're going to step up now and talk about another one of our clients just to give you a real life example of what they did and how they navigated the fast, cheap web services. Okay, I'll take a go back one slide for a second. Yeah, so I just want to talk about this a little bit more because I think everybody in this audience has experienced the struggle to try to achieve all three. And I think what Andrew was trying to stress in the beginning is that all three of these just don't exist together, and that's okay. And he said that, you know, start with one, which I think is really important, um, and then go to two. So if you can achieve two out of these three, you're really in a really great spot. And then more importantly, is achieving that balance between the two that is really important for your customers specifically. So not all customers want to compromise on the quality in order to get something affordable quickly. And not all customers are willing to compromise on the price in order to get something at a higher quality and fast. So every brand will figure out that their customer is willing to compromise on one of these three and they need to figure out which one that is and really target and, com and um, build their product based on that that balance. So, so a good example of this is Courtside Kids. Uh, this is a mom-led brand. She uh, took inspiration from her three boys who are super rough and tough. They're play high level sports and they just want to wear their sports gear all day long every day um, so her job was to create a line of, of boys clothing that she could feel comfortable in sending them to school in their school photos in their family photos um, dinners that just looked really cool crisp and clean but really performed at a price point that matched a, a children's wear line so for us we spent a lot of time in the fabric development land here we're really trying to find a fabric that was extremely durable, that can be washed over and over and over again, that felt really premium, similar to a Lululemon type fabric in adult land pricing, but for children's wear pricing. Um, so balancing that fabric price and developing a fabric that she was comfortable with and that, that met that balance um, for her customer was really important. Um, when she found that, she was flying. Um, she sells out of every single launch she launches and she's doing really well. So until she found that balance um, that really affected her final garment price, uh, it, was a, it was a struggle until then. Thank you. So let's talk about probably the most important element of starting a brand and being successful at it, and that's your customer. I know a lot of people start brands for different reasons, but ultimately before you do anything regarding product or fabric or distribution, you really gotta understand that 
who is going to be buying this? Like, who's going to be utilizing the product or the idea that you're using? Most people kind of leave that to the end. They'll make a beautiful product, they'll align on a strategy, they'll have a marketing goal. But guess what? Your audience, your customer, is such a big part of your budgeting and your uh, data stream that if you don't spend enough time getting to know your customer, you're going to be spending a lot of extra money in different parts of the business. So I'll give you an example. One of our brands did a massive amount of surveying and trying to understand what the customer eats for breakfast, what their favorite colors are, how late do they go to sleep, what are their demographics. All of these elements may seem trivial in nature, but what actually happens is that these, or these information pieces come together in a very cohesive way that allows you to structure your marketing plans. You know that if this customer is looking, um, scrolling through their phone, for example, using their media on their phone and not their PC or, or, or tablet, that's an important element. If you know they're staying up late at night to look through um, your information, you want to be creating ads or structuring your marketing campaigns around that data in a way that uh, people who have not done that would obviously be missing that. Customer loyalty is a big part of repeat customers and as you'll know in the future as you build your brands, you will want to build a golden circle of people, of followers that are going to be supporting your brand no matter what. So we're always looking for that core tight circle of customers that are going to be with you and to access those customers really takes perseverance and determination early on to try to educate yourself on the ways that these customer profiles could be accessed, but also understanding why this customer is important to the brand. Um, again, we have another example from one of our clients that done this successfully that first is going to speak. Yeah, so on top of what Andrew's saying, it's just that really being customer obsessed really knowing who your customer is, what they want, or what they, they think they want or think they or don't have yet. Um, really anticipating their needs and really just understanding um, understanding what they want and creating a way to connect that. And when we see real su success in this area is the brands that create a community. Um, they create a community around their customers, a way for them to connect with each other and a way for them to connect with them. So a good example of that is HikerKind, we're a New York based company, uh, we helped them design and develop some really beautiful hiking wear, technical hiking wear for women that doesn't look technical. And they do a really great thing, they have a hike club, so every second weekend in the summer they organize a hike in their area, a way for them to connect directly with their community, a way for their customers to connect with each other, and a direct link to provide feedback uh, on the garments. So they wear their garments on the hike, they give them direct feedback, um, and it's just an open communication line uh, that allows them to really perfect their product, but also create a really loyal, strong customer base for years and years to come. We can see this a lot being done now online and social media, different platforms, and that is a great way, but more success we're seeing with brands that are doing this now face-to-face. -face. Um, I, think, I think everyone is just creating a little bit, craving a little bit of community after the last few years, um, and so brands that are doing those like in-face interactions and activations are really seeing more success. So pop-ups, um, work group workout classes, um, these hype clubs, like it's a really great way that people are just looking to make friends and they love the brand and it just becomes part of their lifestyle. And that's really, really important in when you're trying to choose from a million brands out there in the same space. The ones that are creating this lifestyle and this community are really seeing success. Thank you. Next, we're going to discuss the big three strategy, product marketing. Now, you can start a brand and be good at two of the three, and you can kind of survive and kind of get by, but you're not really going to start thriving unless all three of these components come together. So what do I mean about business, product, and marketing? Um, first of all, when you're first starting a brand and you're really looking to kind of grow and you know come out of the weeds, you know, out of being a you know, 10, 15 piece collection into more two, three, 400 piece. You wanna have a strategy in place that's gonna take you there to begin with. So you don't wanna start a product and hope to win it later on, which you could do and some people have. So I'm gonna give examples about all three. We have clients who completely skip the business strategy component and went straight into product. Their goal was to perfect the product and focus only on the product. They were obsessed with about the product 
and they hired a premium marketing agency to help push their product. So their idea was that they're gonna launch with the product and have marketing create the market for them. So they, instead of identifying a customer niche in the market, they focus on product first, marketing, and then strategy. So they kind of inverted it. Now that is the proposition that's risky, but we've seen work in the past. So don't think that if one follows another, it could be inverted. Other people completely skipped marketing. So they had a beautiful strategy. They've identified the customer, they knew the niche, They've identified uh, a story that their vision wants to speak to, and they um, recruited a, 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 um, a factory and a mill to build a beautiful product and hired a consultant to kind of help them away. So your business and your business strategy and your product kind of they work together in unity, so the marketing kind of doesn't isn't as required if you feel like the strategy and the product is unified. So as you can see, it's kind of interchangeable, but ultimately it's where the all crisscross together that you're gonna really start driving and getting ahead of your competition. Most brands, again, successful brands, they don't have the right personnel or the skill set to cover all three. It's like when you're starting out as a solo proprietor, you're probably gonna have a skill set maybe in one. Maybe you're really good at talking to people, maybe you're a really good strategist, maybe you already have some design talent or product. But to connect all three together, this is when a team comes together. So you need to start recruiting people or kind of outsourcing some of these components in such a way that makes sense for you. And again, you gotta determine for yourself what is important for you and your audience in terms of your actual success strategy. Um, this comes down to back to mentorship. So if you can find someone in the field that can mentor you or can educate you on some pitfalls to look, look out for any in, of these three circles, that's a step that you can essentially take and skip some of the things that other people have stumbled upon if you're talking to the right people to kind of navigate those waters. Again, it's finding this symmetry between the three that will really get you to strive. You can start with one. We recommend two, but three is where really everything kind of comes together. Okay, now how all this comes together, again, is to do with data. So. Our, a lot of trends right now on TikTok and Instagram, we see all these kids, you know, making 20, 30K a month, and they're talking about how easy it is. That the reality is that it's not so easy, but it is simple. So there is tools available to us now, uh, unprecedented, like never before. Information about technology and how to acquire data has become accessible to all of us, almost for free. And so when you're building a brand and you have data all over the internet, you really want to learn and educate yourself about all the different components that are available to you and how to hijack somebody else's work, for example, and not necessarily steal it, but learn from it. So now we have tools available to us that can go inside a competitor's website and extract all the information from their website, including who is their ad provider, how much they're spending on their ads, what are their top performing SKUs, this information is extremely valuable to you because you want to know what are the winning products that other people are using. You want to know where the buyers for your brand exist. You want to be able to tap into markets of potential drop shippers, whole buyers. You know, you, know, you want to tap into people who access to a lot of boutique stores when you're doing a strategy. Data can help with that. And so again, some of these tools may not be immediately available to you in terms of your knowledge. This is where expertise and mentorship comes in, into place. It's really important to really address the area you feel you're the weakest in, and then outsource that area to a consultancy or, or a mentor who can then guide you, because you will be saving a lot of time and energy if you're given direct access to extremely important data and information that other brands or your competitors are using against you, because this is gonna be a battle, right? In the end, when you're launching a brand and you already have an established mega brand that's already in that market, you gotta find a sweet spot. You're gonna find a secret sauce that's gonna give you the advantage over them. And so a lot of these bigger brands are asleep at the wheel for now, but they, there won't be for long. So as an innovator, as someone brand new, customer loyalty is so big, and we're seeing a lot of successful brands get successful because customers themselves have grown tired of only following the big uh, the massive brands that exist, they're looking to actually, they're willing to buy from somebody new, they want to buy from somebody new. But the story and the vision and the mission of that brand that's new has to resonate with the customer. 
And the only way you can do that is if you have the information available to you on where the customer is, what they were looking for, what they want to get. And the idea in the end is to achieve 1,000 steady customers. Once you hit 1,000 customers, this is the time when you'll be turning over multi-million dollars in your revenues. So your goal should not be about making X amount of money a year or dropping X amount of products or SKUs. Your goal should be how many customers did I acquire this order or how many customers did I get this year? Your customer is worth so much to you. One customer value to, an, to a, a startup brand is about two to three thousand dollars in average, just one person. Why? Because one customer typically buys more than one product at a time and one customer can recommend that to their family and friends and they can come back and buy a second drop or another season or multi, a lot of different colors of the same product. So customer value is extremely important. So when you're looking to buy an inventory and you have, say for example, an opportunity to buy three to five hundred pieces, those three to five hundred pieces doesn't really necessarily mean you need three to five hundred customers. For example, you may only need 100 customers to sell 300 pieces. So a lot of people get scared when they just, you know, talk about inventory or commitment to inventory and they think, oh man, you know, this is a lot of inventory to move. But guess what? If you're customer focused, you just need a handful of loyal customers to buy that off and then you'll fly to the shelves quick. So the important strategy here is not to be so focused about inventory or cost of inventory. It's more important how you're going to get the customers and how those customers are going to maintain them. The key strategy for a lot of influencers or what we're seeing right now on social media how people are selling it, they're selling, they're moving their product through affiliate marketing as a, a mandatory tool. So what they're doing is they're paying other people, they're giving a percentage of, um, of their sales to another agency, group, or a person to move their product for them. So they're going to be paying someone else to sell the products, like a mini sales competition. And the reason that it's so valuable is because your customer acquisition cost or how much it costs to get a free customer is infinite if their customer that's coming in could be worth more than what you spent for them. So for example, if it costs you $10 to give to somebody else to sell their product, but if the return is $30, then that's a worthwhile proposition. You can do that infinitely X amount of times because you're always gonna be getting three times what you spend to get the customer. So the idea here is to have a 3x return on your customer acquisition. So as a brand, you should know or hope to know how much money do you have to spend per new customer to get them to come to your website, to get them to buy, because that is an extremely important element. If you know how much you're spending for one additional customers, you can then scale that infinitely because you can keep pumping money into that customer acquisition and keep growing infinitely. So this is why I think data is extremely important and understanding your customer is super important as well. Okay, budget and pricing. Now I know a lot of people when they're starting out, budgets is a big part and a big component of you know what, what your decision making process is. Ultimately your budgets are determined by your own initiative and how fast you want to get to market and how ambitious you are. Now being risk perverse and being kind of looking to save money in every step is not always the best strategy that we found with our successful brands. And that's because every time that you choose not to do something, there's an opportunity cost involved with that. So for example, say if you want to start a collection with 20 pieces instead of 500 pieces. You could say, okay, that's great. I'm, you know, I'm saving money, I'm starting slow. I'm gonna be you know, organic growth. But the person who started with 500 pieces, they're gonna put a, a ton of work, just like you may, into a beautiful photo shoot. They're gonna spend X amount of money on a website, just like you. So you both put in 5K into marketing and website, but you only have 20 pieces to sell, and they have 500. So when a customer identifies that and they land on your site, you could be sold out in you know, two hours, boom, gone. They still have 500 pieces to sell. So it's gonna cost you X amount of time and energy to get someone on your website. By the time they're already there, might as well give them as much of a spread, as much as opportunity as you can, so you can capture the revenue from them. If you under um, price yourself or if you don't have enough inventory on hand, all of that effort and all of that time building a beautiful website, getting the right models for photo shoot, it's kind of wasted. So there is definitely a factor involved when you're doing budgets. 
how small or how big you want to start is a big conversation because starting small is not always the right answer. It's more important to kind of assess your own budget and almost stretch it, kind of like when you're buying a home. You want to buy a, the, the maximum house you can, can afford because it's going to over time go up in value as you put more effort into it. Same as the brand. You really want to push yourself to get a, 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 a sizable budget that you think is going to be representative of your own efforts. Some of our brands come to us and they don't even start, they will come to our company, they'll tell us about their idea and, and don't come back for another 11 to 15 months because the number one concern for them at that point isn't how well their product's going to look like or where they're going to get the sourcing, is where am I going to get the capital to invest into my business. So that is a big step for everybody. The conversation should be about, you know, where am I get the, getting the money to have a, a, a lot, enough of a runway to give myself a fair chance because you could just spend you know, a couple of grand every year slowly progressing but the markets and fashion change quick and so do trends so if you're too slow to get to market you're giving somebody else a chance to get there before you if you're starting too small uh, the, uh, the, uh, the technology will pass you by always you know things move quick and you got to be able to pivot in the spot and again it comes down to correctly identifying your own perspectives in terms of who you're kind of partnering with, who your mentorships are, and really listening to their advice and where you think you should be starting out with. Um, when it comes to product costing, this is a good diagram to kind of follow. You have a third, a third of your garment price um, is going to be determined by your main fabrics. Terms of labels is another third, and labor overhead is another third. So as we see later on, as you grow, the labor and factory overhead component will change based on how many units you're ordering. Of course, the more units you order, the you know, economies of scale will say that you will then be given preferential cost, right? So then your actual cost of goods will go down, but your cost, your price to the customer will say the same or rise over time. So one 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 thing is going down, the other thing is going up. So you actually you actually start making more money over time. You become more successful as you um, get more products. So inventory fears aren't as realized as most people think. And I think in our experience, having enough inventory on hand protects you from running out, especially at a time where a lot of brands are going viral and customer preferences are going towards supporting new brands. So we would urge people to consider working with manufacturers that they previously have not thought were too big for them because a lot of manufacturers are also rolling the dice, partnering with new brands and want to invest in new brands because they want to be the one who supported your eyes up and there's a lot of loyalty with that and I think your customer relationship with a factory is a big part of your brand and I know for those of you who listened to Anna's talk yesterday your factory relationship is a big big part of being successful in this business and your vendor connection should be protected and respected because the vendor is ultimately only going to be successful as you are so if the vendor takes a roll of the dice and you don't succeed they also lose out but there's a lot of vendors who are willing to work with your minimums and even give you special treatment if they feel like you have a sound case and you have a strong business plan or you have a great product and this comes with the territory again I would urge that if you do or can partner with a company, an agency, or a mentor that can leverage their experience and their existing contacts in your favor and kind of and then kind of utilize that pool of companies they're already working with and kind of dictate and support your own vendor network connections, that can be of immense help because that company or agency, they can actually get lower prices for you than you could picking up the phone yourself because they have bigger pull in the industry. So they can actually come in and reduce costs over time for you, especially when you're starting out. That's a great strategy that um, brands that we work with utilize us for, and that's one of the reasons why they come to us to begin with. It's because they want to access the pool of talent of the vendors that we work with. At the same time, Can I say yeah, go ahead. I think you said something really important, okay. and I think I just want to emphasize it. Um, you mentioned a little bit about, about your garment pricing, and I think um, on the design level and production level, I get a lot of questions on this, and I think it's it's 
the main question we always get, how do I price my garment in a way that I'm gonna be successful and that's gonna, it's gonna incorporate all my, my costs. Um, so looking at this in the beginning, the third, the garment price being um, your fabric is so, so important. Um, knowing what price of fabric and what price range you can be is like so important, it's gonna set you up for success in the future. Uh, picking a $20 fabric for something that you wanna price at $20 isn't gonna work. So just like really thinking about that in the beginning um, and then working backwards to think, okay, if I wanna price my garment at $20, then my fabric needs to be how much? Um, and so, and then only looking at that range of fabrics. If you want to have more expensive fabric, increase your price range. Um, but that's really important because sometimes we get so far down the line and then you're like, oh, oh crap, my garment is too expensive for my customers. Um, and the second thing is then just making sure that you're marking up your garment enough or your product, marking it up enough so that you're gonna be taking home enough. And Andrew you had a really great point about how um, as you get ordering larger quantities with factories, they're willing to give you a kickback. Uh, but the thing about that is your overall costs about all your other things are probably gonna increase. So you're probably gonna get more employees, you're probably gonna be spending more on marketing. All your other things are gonna increase. So marking it up only like $10 or, or you know 10% because you think, oh, I'll start out early and I'll make my margins later doesn't always work out. So just make sure that you're advocating for yourselves, that you're marking up. Andrew has a really great um, equation that he can talk to you about um, that's gonna make sure that you're marking up your garments and your products enough that you're gonna get your return because we hate doing all this work and then hearing that you're not making any money so thank you for that um, thank you again and that's a good point and that brings me to a different kind of conversation and that is what is your distribution gonna look like for your product are you are you specifically gonna be working with e-commerce because that will require different strategies so if you were to go wholesale and say you make a product with a factory, you have X amount of units, you have salesman samples, now you're gonna go and knock on doors and try to get this product in front of many stores who will then buy it from you. That's a completely different strategy, it can work on its own, but you then leverage, you're essentially giving up control to that vendor who can then, for example, mark down your own product and offer it a discount undercutting your own website. And how is that gonna work out, right? Or the, these guys wanna make sure that you know only that they're only buying like some other units from you. You have to have guaranteed inventory on hand. That means it's a bigger investment in the inventory plan. So the distribution strategy before you even launch is super crucial. Are you gonna be e-commerce only? Are you doing 50-50, half e-commerce, half um, wholesale? Are you only interested in wholesale? That's really important. Another element you think about is what is your exit strategy? Some brands will specifically be created with the idea to be acquired or be exited within the first three to four years. That is a legitimate business strategy that is very viable. You, you don't have to build a legacy. You don't always have to build something super lasting. If you feel that you can create a brand that could be acquired by a bigger brand, you can take that same money and reinvest it into more products. So we see multiple serial entrepreneurs working with us who specialize in building companies just to be acquired for profit. So some people are extremely financially driven and that's a part of the fashion industry because fashion has high margins and it attracts a lot of venture capitalists and a lot of investment firms. Lastly, a thing that you may also want to consider is a licensing play. So a licensing play is when you create a product or invent the fabric, a proprietary piece, that you can then patent and market or license to another brand or entity to be used in their own collection but pay you a royalty or a licensing fee. This is another strategy that works very well for people who are interested in exploring that opportunity. So these are more advanced strategies and these could be talked about with a mentor or a consulting group that you can approach. And you know, for example, that's something when we do at our Pelmer, we talk to our clients about what is it that you want to accomplish, what are the steps required to getting what you want, are you interested in, in building a business, are you interested in getting the most exposure, are you interested in making money, all of these things is something that we think is very important and something that we challenge you all to think about as well. Do you want to add anything to that question? Yeah. Lastly, networking. So mentorship and networking is a, one of the fundamentals of 
being successful. So you want to tap into as many networks as you can early on. Hit up any of your friends that you think or anybody you know in the industry that can help you along the way. Do you have someone that can build you a beautiful website? Do you have an uncle that knows someone who is good at marketing? Do you have somebody else who's very good at fabric sourcing? So the, the key here is to have a network that you can explore and you can collaborate with to help you along the path. Because being on your own, tugging through this long journey is very difficult. And the more people that you can get to help you along the way, the better you will feel. And I think the best way to describe that is you want to protect your own peace at all times. And we all have X amount of energy in us. And if we exhaust that energy, we will become discouraged. And many ideas die because of discouragement. You never want to get to a place where you feel burned out. You always want to protect that energy. Second thing, we urge you to respect your time. Your time is such a valuable asset that disrespecting it and obsessively investing it into something that will take you much longer to, that has a high learning curve and it's gonna take you forever to do is not the best use of your time. You gotta, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO of your company, you gotta know when to delegate and what pieces of the business to outsource because that is what all the com competitors are doing. That's what all successful brands are doing. They're only, the, the business owners are only focusing on the most impactful part of the business that they themselves can do. So if you're really good at speaking to people, you should be on the phone more. Or if you're really good at, you know, if you're a numbers person, then maybe you should be doing like the budgeting and the, and the strategy yourself. If you're a designer and you really have a core understanding of the fabrics, then outsource the marketing part. Do not attempt to do everything on your own because it's gonna stall your own progress and it's gonna delay you getting to market. Lastly, besides time, the second most important, I would say, asset, is attention. You need to be able to drum up attention for your brand to be successful in the modern way. So attention can come from different ways. It can come from just being online. It can come from being a part of focus groups. So you can join a focus group, you can join a uh, Facebook group or a Twitter group and just be on there and start commenting on people. A lot of brands that we're seeing go to their competitors' social media channels and comment under daily posts. Because if you comment under a post of your competitors, other people who are already gonna go to that post will see your comment, and they will see your brand being in their own tweet. If you do this across multiple competitors, then you're essentially getting free advertisement on their own social channels, which is a strategy that we see deployed a lot. Um, other ways that you can really get uh, ahead of networking is of course attending shows like this, talking to different people, approaching companies that are specifically designed to kind of help you along the way, like a Carol Mark, and really getting to understand what your options are and you know how to get there is, is again, is a journey, and we hope that all of us here are kind of supporting each other and want us to collaborate as much as we can because the more we support each other, the more new brands come to market, and new brands means new possibilities, not only for you, but for your customers. Ultimately, the fashion industry is super, super connected in a way that no other industry is. So you have your fabric people who make the, the yarns, you have your freight forwarders, you have the people who sew, you have all of the people who do your marketing, you have the people who do the designing, you have your ultimate customers, you have so many people connected, just one product connects hundreds of elements and fashion is unique that way. And because it is so unique that way, we have to be respectful of all of the components that exist. And the industry is pretty small, so if you don't want to burn bridges along the way, and you want to be very careful about who it is that you're um, focusing on, who it is that you're talking to, and really try to get the most out of it without being too pushy or too aggressive. So that's, that's kind of uh, wraps up the talk. And now we'll just open the floor to any questions. If you guys have any questions at all, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, you can um, meet us at our booth 102 and we can discuss in detail anything that you want to uh, address. Yeah.
is 2.5 to 3 times, and I say 4, um, 4 times your garment price. And it's obviously unique depending on what your um, your other hard costs are, but to be safe, I, Andrew would say 2.5 to 3 times your the cost of the garment, everything included to create it. Um, so, The full cost, yeah, fabric trans, a cut and sew, all those yes. things. Um, so three, and I, I say four just because I'm thinking longer down the line and all the things. You don't want to be increasing your prices if you don't have to. Um, so as much more that you can mark up, the, the better. Yeah, so the question was, what's the, you know, how much money should you be adding on top of your total cost for your product? Now your total cost of the product is going to vary dramatically if you're doing it locally or if you're doing it overseas, because overseas has its own window of costs involved, like freight, like duties. Um, but local has its own challenges as well, because local it requires a lot more management on your part to bring all of the trims, all of the fabrics into the cut and sew studio. And that's the overhead and labor, of course, is higher. So the end product goal, that whatever it is gonna cost, we usually recommend anywhere from two to three times what you're paying for at factory level to be then resold to your customer. That is if you're doing it directly to consumer, so if you D2C brand on e-commerce, that's what you should be going for. Now, if you're doing wholesale, that's a different story because wholesale, you will have to take a hit in your margins in exchange for a guaranteed inventory. So it's a volume play. This is a, an important element to consider because you feel if you your product, it does require, you know, is, is, isn't strong enough for you to market on yourself on a, on your own website, but you think it's going to be really successful in somebody else's store, you can exclusively focus on the wholesale strategy and price it in such a way that it's appealing to wholesalers and make it easy for them to say yes. And again, that's something that companies like us, uh, Pelmark, we can help you with really position yourself in a way that makes sense for you in terms of the strategy you selected at the start of the business. Initial budget should go towards marketing, the total budget. Uh, your marketing budget will be heavily determined on what kind of marketing that you want to focus on. Some people exclusively spend all of their marketing on a single entity like a trade show. You could be extremely successful taking your products straight to trade show and really get in front of audience and selling it like that. Uh, you have enough traffic that to go through your first collection. Other people ex uh, spend all of their marketing hiring five or six salespeople, and these people work on commission around huge metropolitan areas around America, and these guys will push inventory for you on your behalf for a percentage. So you, your marketing budget will just go towards them. They will find ways to distribute your product and it's their business how they do it, but they can say, okay, you know, give, give me a chance, I, I can move 100 pieces for you in the first 30 days. If I can't do that, then I'll, do, uh, then I'll work for you for free, I'll give you something back. So basically these salespeople, it's their business to know how to move your product and you should be able to connect with them. That's just one of many different strategies that we've seen. We've seen in our business, we see about 16 to 17 different sales strategies that we've seen 
people successfully. In the future, I'm happy to do a presentation on sales alone, but because we just wanted to kind of do a high level overview of everything, you know, we don't have as much time as we would like, but that's something that we can address directly with you in person if you want to come see us. So my question has to do with customer acquisition. Um, do you have any insights or maybe even strategies on how to reach out to customers who want to own luxury items but at a fraction of the price? And that doesn't mean they necessarily have to be not rich or not have the means. They just want to have luxury items just by less and the big brands, the big luxury brands. Do you have any insights about that? So the question is, how do we reach customers that are looking for, in the luxury market, that are looking for products that are priced at a fair a price point and not at the levels that are of a luxury brand, but still have the same kind of value and quality? Now this is a good question and I want to emphasize something. When you're pricing your product, if you are in your luxury market, the luxury part of the of the apparel market functions a little bit differently than your traditional market because when it comes to luxury, the value of the product isn't related to a formula that's the value of the cost of goods that you paid. So for example, if you paid $100, there's no formula that you have to times that by three and you should be selling your product for $300. And we've seen products sold for two or $3,000. That doesn't mean that their cost of goods was 500 or 1,000 to make. No, the value of a, of a luxury brand comes from the proposition that the relationship between you and your audience, it's the trust, it's the vision, it's the identity of the brand that has carries more value than the cost of the product itself. And so as a brand starting out, you this is why connecting with the customers and building that trust is far more important than even the product itself or the, or the marketing strategies or any of that. You should be building a community first and really building that rapport with the customer because if they trust you as a brand, as a person. They want to buy from people, buy from people, so they want to buy from you first. And if you resonate with them, they'll be able to spend their money with you exclusively and you can keep raising prices regardless of what other people are doing because you've already established a, a loyal following. I, I think uh, Andrew said something earlier and it's about being customer obsessed. And I think that's really great. Like, way for you to acquire customers is really like leaving you reading your customers where are they shopping what are they doing are they shopping on the second hand market are they are, are they in the groups of buying selling Chanel bags like where are they and be there like be where your customer is and then also create that community around them like, uh, we have a lot of brands that are creating like trade trade or buy sell groups from their brand products they have um, customer led like Facebook groups in which they're buying and selling in each other so it's basically creating that community and where maybe people are selling and buying luxury items in which you can also sell then your items or a way to access customers that are buying those items at that price range. Thank you for your One other thing I wanted to mention is your product design, your presentation to the customer is also extremely important. Because the first time a customer is going to open your product, the very first thing they're going to see is your packaging. So a lot of brands kind of skim over that, but I think personally, from my experience, your packaging design should be a big part of your marketing proposition. And that's your first point of contact with the customer. So having a clever packaging idea is as big of a part of the actual product itself as the product itself. So that is something we do want you to consider. And I know packaging is a big issue just because shipping products to customers gets really expensive, especially post COVID you see shipping rates go up and a lot of companies like Amazon and so forth are now thinking about charging customers for returns. Your return strategy is gonna be a crucial part of the business. We're talking fashion, returns are, are for our first brand is about 25 to 30% of all of your entire inventory will be returned. And this is a fact that you have to live with. Um, the most successful brands really try hard to push it down to low teens, maybe 12 to 15 percent. But the reality is that a lot of people shop by choosing a lot of items in the cart and then ordering them in and then returning them much later. Now what that, what that creates is that it hyperinflates the value of the brand right away because on paper 
if you're ordering five products from a brand times a thousand customers, that looks like the brand's making millions on the revenue alone. But if what if the customer's returning four out of those five pieces and only keeping one, guess what? Those revenue models are, are shrink low. But that doesn't matter to the brand itself if their strategy was to be acquired. So when you're pitching investors, they're saying, look, here's my revenue. I'm looking to offset this at four or five X. Investors are, are so focused on the revenue that they don't realize that the returns completely negate a lot of that formula. So again, this is more advanced thinking, but you should be thinking about returns, packaging, how returns get processed. So if you have a brand, you start just starting out, chances are you're gonna be going out of your basement or shipping out of your garage. Who is gonna be processing those returns? Is that is that return gonna immediately be sent back as a new product? Are you, are you discounting your returns? Are you paying for repackaging? So as you grow, those answers will need and deserve attention, especially as you completely scale, you're gonna be going into a distribution center. The strategy behind selecting a good distribution center, someone who is familiar with fashion products, someone who understands how returns work, someone who can process the speed of receiving a return and repackaging it and resending it, those are very specific strategies that every brand needs to know and do really uh, focus on as they grow because that is a big money saver and a big task ahead of you. Is there any other questions? Good. Well, thank you so much for coming and uh, we hope to see you and enjoy the show.